Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and screen share then. Um, <coughs> let's have a PowerPoint presentation to go along with this. Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks for having me today. Uh, my name's Sam Knapp. I, I work at the Alaska DNR, um, the Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. Um, I am a natural resource tech who works for our radon outreach program with my colleague Jennifer Athey, who is a geologist here um, working on other uh, geological hazards as well. So today we'll just talk about um, radon prevalence in Alaska and how to get tested and kind of touch on our program. And we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Um, First, we'll just do a, like a brief overview of what DGGS, so I'll, I'll abbreviate uh, the Department of Geological and Geophysical Surveys as DGGS. Um, what we do overall, there's many different uh, groups in DGGS, um, ranging from mineral expo exploration to geological mapping, um, volcanology. Um, there is a subsection on hazards, geological hazards, environmental hazards, and radon, along with things like asbestos and arsenic and groundwater, is one of the things that falls under that. Um, so we do different kinds of stuff here if you're interested in following up on that. Um, one of you mentioned before we started that you've been receiving radon test kits from the Cooperative, Cooperative Extension Service, and um, we've been partnering with them. This is actually the same program uh, of few years ago after the 2018 earthquake, the program kind of changed hands. So uh, Cooperative Extension is no longer leading the charge on this program. It's, it's us over at DGGS, but we still do work closely, closely with them, um, but they're just no longer administering the program. So if you re have received tests from them in the past, it's, it's the same now as receiving them from us. Um, We've done a lot of outreach. We go to fairs when it's not COVID time and um, try and get as many people tested in the state as possible. Another thing that we do with this program that's kind of fun is uh, we try to participate in this nationwide poster contest for children. Um, so children from across the country um, submit posters to their state group or state organization um, and then a winner is chosen and then they advance to nationals. Um, so you'll see some interesting posters. Um, here's another from years past, um, Radon, the Silent Killer. Um, this particular poster, this is the one that won first place this past year in 2021 and was submitted by Leo, who's a middle schooler from Fairbanks. Um, and I think it, it does a good job illustrating you know, one of the worries of radon is that it's coming through cracks in your foundation um, and that it uh, does cause lung cancer. Um, you should get your home tested. So we talked a little bit before the presentation about um, the risks of radon and, and kind of what those numbers are and what they mean. Um, this chart on at the far left, you'll see radon levels, and that's uh, the unit there is picocuries per liter. And what that is, it's, a, it's just a way of measuring um, the amount of radiation that's, that's given off within a liter of air. Um, radon gas is, is radioactive, um, and when it decays, it, it gives off an alpha particle um, in the form of, or that's the radiation. Um, so the EPA has set four as the acceptable or, or the level at which um, you should think about mitigating your home. So if you're higher than four picocuries per liter, um, you should definitely consider mitigating your home. If you're below it, you know they still say, um, consider mitigating down to two picocuries per liter, although most people don't, don't follow that. Um, below two picocuries per liter, it's very difficult to, to reduce levels in your house. And as a comparison, 0 0.4 um, is the average ambient level outside. So if you're just standing outside in the fresh air, that's about the radon level that you'll have. Um, so in this chart as well is 
the estimated cases of lung cancer per 1,000 people after a lifetime of exposure. And um, a lifetime is a lot longer than 20 to 25 years, but I think those are the numbers they were using in this study. Um, so if you smoke, um, you actually have a, a much higher risk, not only from of getting lung cancer, not only from smoking, but um, there's kind of a synergy that happens between smoking and radon exposure to increase your chances of cancer um, by many times. Um, so at four picocuries per liter, the action, the action level, we're seeing that um, seven people in a thousand are, are likely to get lung cancer uh, who don't smoke, whereas 62 of those thousand who do smoke um, may get lung cancer at that exposure level. Um, and you can see how the numbers go down as you get a uh, lower concentration and obviously go up as the concentration goes up. Um, in the Fairbanks area, just for comparison, um, we typically see in the hills, there can be some higher levels. I've, I've seen readings come back um, over a thousand picocuries per liter for certain houses. Um, so that, that's very high <laughs> chance of lung cancer. If you're living in a house like that, um, we see a lot of, a lot of houses come back below a hundred um, and certainly below uh, 20 or 30, but anything up in double digits, you should definitely be thinking about getting your house fixed. So where does radon come from? Um, radon is a product of uh, radioactive decay, um, starting with uranium that's found in our bedrock and soils. Uh, this is another example of one of these posters from the poster con contest. Um, and I think it does a good job of uh, kind of explaining what's going on. So you have uranium in the bedrock and the soil um, through a series of decay processes, this uranium up here uh, eventually goes to radium, um, which has a fairly stable half-life. And when radium decays, um, it goes off an alpha particle and goes to radon. Um, this number right here, 3.82 uh, D stands for days. That's the half-life. Um, so radon, uh, if you have an amount of radon and wait 3.82 days and come back and measure it again, um, about half of it will have uh, decayed further on down the chain. Um, it will go all the way. I don't know if you can see this here. And the last stop on, on the decay list is lead. Um, that's the stable, the stable endpoint. Um, the thing that makes radi radon different from all these other compounds and, or all these other elements that we're seeing here on the chart is that radon is gas. Um, and so it can easily move up through the soil um, and into your home uh, where it can get concentrated and cause problems. This map shows um, mapped uranium presence in sediments and soils throughout the state. Um, the, the red, the oranges and reds show higher, high, higher levels. Um, these are just percentiles, so they're not actual, actual uh, numbers attached to this. But, um, and lower levels down into the purples uh, and, and blues. So I put these dots on the map just for reference. This black dot here is Fairbanks. You can see it's in an area of relatively high radon concentration um, relative to the rest of the state. This dot down here is Anchorage um, and relatively low uranium concentration compared to the rest of the state. So, um, and the, the radon prevalence kind of follows those trends where we, we tend to see more radon in these areas where uranium is high, although uh, our mapping isn't perfect and um, you can have small isolated deposits that create radon. So there's a lot of spatial variability. Now, how does radon get into buildings? Um, so we've talked about that it's, it's in the bedrock or there's uranium in the bedrock and in the soil. Um, and that, that as it goes through a decay process, it turns into uh, radon, the gas. Um, it's gonna go through any gap um, between your home's foundation and the soil, um, such as cracks in the foundation. Um, it could be expansion joints. Uh, this particular one is pretty notorious between uh, the slab of a basement and the block walls. Um, it could be cracks in your block walls, it could be coming from under your crawl space if you have one. Um, it could be coming up around 
uh, plumbing pipes uh, or electrical lines. It could be coming up through hollow cavities in your wall. Um, and lastly, not so common, but it, it could be coming from your water if you have a well. Um, water that has high radon concentration that when that water aerosolizes um, in showers and sinks and things like that and goes into the air where you're gonna breathe those water particles with radon in it, then it can cause uh, problems as well. Not so much of a, a concern to ingest it. Um, radon has been known to cause stomach cancer um, when ingested, but it's not as serious um, as, as lung cancer. There's not as great of a chance. Um, so how does, let's see, um, as far as air movement into homes, uh, the stack effect is mainly what's driving um, this push of radon gas through your foundation. Um, and it's the same effect that comes with uh, heating systems, chimneys, um, as hot air rises out of your home or a chimney, um, the column of air that is going with it creates kind of this pressure differential that will drive air into um, the lower space. Otherwise, if you had this air escaping from the top and nothing came in to replace it, you'd be eventually making a vacuum. And so this negative pressure has to be relieved and, and that air has to come from somewhere. And usually it comes from um, either gaps in your vapor barrier coming from the outdoors or um, cracks in your foundation, uh, places where air can get through. Um, we already talked briefly about uh, this four picocuries per liter. We don't have to go into this graph too much. Um, four picocuries per liter is what the EPA has decided is the, the action level at which um, you should do or take some measures to um, mitigate in your home. There, that doesn't mean that there is no risk below four picocuries per liter. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't mean that um, you know something magical happens at that number. It's just been an arbitrary choice. So any radon carries some, some risk with it, but um, this is where the EPA has decided to, to set the point at which you should think about mitigating. So as far as um, Alaska compared to the rest of the country, um, the rest of the country has had a lot more testing and recording of, of prevalence and, and data um, with the amount of radon found in homes. Um, this map was made by the EPA and you can see that it's broken down to a county level um, across the lower 48 um, with red being the highest concentrations where homes average above the action level and uh, yellow being low concentrations below two picocuries per liter. Um, we'll talk about these. There's a, an offset map here of Alaska and we'll talk about that in a second. So the difficulty with um, making a similar map for Alaska is that uh, Alaska is much bigger <laughs> than the rest of the country. Um, and being a relatively young state, um, there have been fewer tests done here. And so we have fewer tests done over a larger area, meaning that there's a lot of uncertainty with um, the amount of radon found in different areas throughout the state. So this was a map that was made in the late 80s by the EPA. And um, it's actually caused a, a lot of misconceptions through the years. Um, there were not that many tests that went into making this map. And when you have um, burrows like as big as the Yukon Koekuk burrow, um, with only a few tests being taken over this huge area, it's pretty misleading to say that um, you know this enormous area is going to have low radon levels. Um, and and same goes for even you know the Fairbanks North Star Burrow uh, being fairly large, and not that many tests going into saying that it it's. Uh, a zone two, meaning that there's kind of a moderate risk there. Um, there's just a lot of spatial variability uh, here and everywhere, but uh, this map kind of oversimplifies and has led a lot of people to believe that radon is not a problem in Alaska when that's not actually the truth. Um, yeah, so th this just shows um, on the right here, there was 
the Alaska Division of Public Health analyzed some 3,000 tests in, in 2015 and found that uh, indeed the radon levels were a lot higher than expected. And so they came up with this quote that radon is an underrecognized health risk that warrants widespread attention throughout the state. So um, something that we've been trying to, to do, kind of taking the reins from the Cooperative Extension Service is, is establishing this radon database. Um, so many tests have been recorded through the years. We've had, um, as of 2019, we had about 4,700 records total. Um, as of today, I haven't run the numbers recently, but it's probably approaching 7,000 records um, of tests done throughout the state. And we know um, where they are. And so we're able to map uh, radon prevalence and get a better idea of what's going on. So when we take that data and make a map similar to the one the EPA had, we, we find that um, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, the Denali Borough, Matsu, um, actually have high radon concentrations. So when you take the average of uh, houses tested, the average is coming out above four picocures per liter. We're finding in other areas of the state that um, we just don't have enough data. So the, these dashed lines in, in these boroughs mean that there's just not enough data to conclusively say what's going on here. Um, and so you can compare this result, you know, with very high concentrations or, or the um, worrisome concentrations in bigger parts of the state to um, the old EPA map. Um, and, and you can see that uh, the, this gives you a lot <laughs> better idea of what's going on. Um, just as a, uh, an example, um, YKHC, the uh, Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation uh, did some limited testing um, in that area and, and found that, uh, well, there, there needs to be more testing done. Um, they had some high levels come out. And, and so going back to the map um, down in the YK Delta area, there's just not enough tests to, to say conclusively what's going on down there. Okay, so um, this is the Alaska radon map that I mentioned before. Um, this is available online and I'll, I'll show you how to get to it later. Um, for now, I'll demonstrate just using it. Um, click on this link that will take, take us to the DDGS webpage. Um, and you can play around in this interactive map. Um, the color coding, the color coding is the same as before where um, red means that the average of test results is higher than four. Orange means that it's between two and four and uh, kind of light yellow is below two. The little LCs stand for low count and that's where there aren't enough tests in this area to um, say anything meaningfully. Um, so as we zoom in, um, the, the scale changes and as we get closer, the, the hexagons become translucent. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit. I think I'm going to use this over here. So looking at Fairbanks, you can kind of see that um, down in town, for example, tends to be lower compared to the, the surrounding hills. If I click on any given hexagon, um, I get the stats for that one. Um, so this one that I've just clicked on, out of 34 observations, the mean was 11. 0.4 picocures per liter, um, the minimum was 0.6, and the maximum was 78.5. Uh, you can see if I click over here on this low count one, uh, so only two observations is coming from or are coming from this hexagon. So we can't quite trust the results from that quite yet. Um, another thing you can do with this map, uh, you can type in an address. If you want to know your exact um, location instead of having to search for it, so I'll just do the DGGS office, which is uh, 3354 College Road in Fairbanks, and it pops up for me. So I click on that and it'll zoom in to that address for me. So I can see that this is 
in a red area, um, 35 observations here and a mean of, of 6.4, fairly close to an orange area, um, 45 observations with a mean of 2.5. Now that doesn't mean that um, when you cross this line that something, something happens. Um, you're really just as likely to get a high rate on result um, here as you are over here. Um, there's so much spatial variability with this. Part of this is that this hexagon is, is catching um, kind of these higher levels up, up past uh, like Yankovic Road and getting, getting into the higher elevations up there. But it gives you a basic idea of the risk, um, the relative risk where your home is. Okay, so I'm gonna get back to the PowerPoint. Let's go through these slides here. Okay, so um, one thing that we do with testing then is we, we ask for your permission to then use your test result to um, better inform that map. Um, back when we were on paper, we were having people sign, sign and date saying, yes, I, I agree uh, to have my results in this database. I understand that um, everything is kept confidential. We don't give out data unless a court ordered us to, which to the state has never happened and I don't, don't foresee it happening. Um, and there's no personal information that goes along with, with that data. So it just get mer it get, gets merged statistically into an area. Um, and you'll only see these numbers. So everybody within this hexagon was one of 13 tests and there's no way to tell where or who those were. Okay, so there are several types of radon tests that we work with. Um, most commonly our program deals with activated charcoal adsorption tests. Um, these are short-term tests lasting anywhere between three and seven days. Um, we also give out Alpha track kits. Um, these are longer term tests that last between three and 12 months. Um, the difference between these, the activated charcoal actually has powdered charcoal, like the same stuff you would feed to your dog if it ate something bad. Um, but that charcoal is capturing um, radon from the air. And then the laboratory is going to measure with a fine Geiger counter the amount of radiation coming off that sample. Um, with the alpha track tests, uh, there's a, a small film in there that can, uh, they can basically process and count the number of um, alpha radiation particles that have hit that under a certain time period um, and can count and back calculate the radon concentration from that. So most likely if you um, are participating in this program, you will get an activated charcoal test. Um, but if you would like a longer term test, the alpha tracks, we can, we can do that as well. Um, some of you may be familiar with these short-term electret or the continuous monitors. These are things that um, like home inspectors use, for example, and, um, or you may purchase if you have a high radon level and you wanna be able to continuously monitor the, the level. Um, I'm just going to skip this. So how to test uh, with the activated charcoal test. So this is most likely the, the kind that you'd be getting from this program. Um, you may be familiar with these. They look like a small envelope. Um, they come in a double packaged plastic container. Um, when you get the test, when you're ready to do the test, and only when you're ready to start the, the test, you can remove it from the plastic. Um, there's also instructions here that you can't see there on the other side of this packaging, but so each test will come with instructions. Um, once it's removed from the packaging, it can be considered started. Uh, it's now being exposed to the air in your home. Um, there are some important things to fill out and I filled out an example just to go through here. Uh, so up here, you're gonna write your name. Um, there's a line for your address, and this is the physical address at which you're doing the test. So I just uh, wrote in the office address here in Fairbanks. And if you would like to receive the test either by email or fax, um, you'll get your results a little bit faster. Um, you can write that here on this line. If you leave this blank, they're going to send the results to uh, 
uh, this address that you've listed up here. Really important is getting the starting date and time and then the ending date and time when you finish the test. Um, there's a, a line of numbers here. Um, whatever the day of the month, I just arbitrarily chose. Uh, this one was started on the 16th, so I circled the 16 and then started at 8 a.m. Um, and this test would have been, uh, the example is five days later, so 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, so this ended on the 21st at 9 p.m. And it's important to circle these numbers. Without these numbers, the lab cannot report your results. Um, at the bottom, there's a few questions about the environment in which the test is, is laid out. So uh, the first thing is the temperature, um, just give or take you know, a few degrees. If it's closer to 70, you can, you can circle 70. Um, the floor level at which the test is uh, conducted. Something to note is that you're going to want to test on the lowest livable level of your home. So if you have a basement, but it's not finished and you don't spend much time there, I advise testing in the first floor. <laughs> if you have a crawl space, for example, you're not going to test in the crawl space, you're gonna test on the first floor. And that will ensure that you're uh, measuring the level of the air that you're actually breathing. Um, there's a question, were closed house conditions maintained during the test? Um, closed house conditions just means that you don't have windows or doors open for ventilation. Um, in February or March here in Fairbanks, I don't think it's something you need to worry about. So basically, if you're in heating season, uh, you shouldn't have windows open anyway. Um, and if you did the test during the summer, uh, you would just want to make sure that you're not having any windows or, or doors open for ventilation purposes, but you can go in and out as, as you normally would. Um, if you have a crawl space and there are vents, you're going to want to close those vents. Um, and then it, marking if you're testing for the first time, um, if this is a follow-up test, um, you might be doing it for a real estate transaction um, or a post mitigation test means that you've done something to fix uh, the radon levels in your home and, and now you're testing to see if your mitigation system is effective or not. And then last, they want to check to make sure that you've uh, read the instructions. Um, the test will have uh, this cardboard insert in it. And the purpose of this cardboard insert, um, it, it's not attached to anything. But if you bend this, uh, this piece here, it's meant to wedge and hold the mouth open um, so that air can move in and out, but that no breezes are going to um, come in, in through the mouth. Uh, they want it to make sure that uh, it's exposed to the air, but protected from drafts. Uh, the test is also gonna have this little hanger on it, just like you would see on a piece of clothing. <clears throat> you can use that to hang from objects. The test can be, uh, it doesn't really matter the height. They suggest breathing height is a good, good area, three to five feet off the ground. Um, if you don't have something to hang it from, you can set it on a ledge. Uh, places where you shouldn't have the test, however, um, don't have the test near uh, an open, or not an open door, but a door that goes to the outside because this is constantly going to be getting uh, fresh air blasted on it. Um, don't have the test near sources of high humidity like sinks, uh, showers, um, and also try and keep the test away from high heat sources. Um, after the testing period is done, so again, it's between three and seven days, you can go ahead and remove this insert. Um, it will just pull straight out. It's not attached to anything. And um, at this time period, this is when you're gonna fill out the, uh, the ending date and time. On the inside of the mouth of the package, there's uh, this little peel strip. Um, it's just like you would see on an envelope. You'll peel it and seal it shut. Um, if there's any doubt in the seal, um, go ahead and, and use some tape. Um, the lab won't care if it's taped. Uh, they will care, however, if, if there's a, a breach in that seal and they won't report your results. So if in doubt, go ahead and tape it. Um, 
there, there's no, no harm in having it sealed better than it needs to be. Um, you can also go ahead and, and clip off that, that little hanger. Now the testing envelopes themselves do have prepaid postage on them. Um, there's a, uh, they'll go to the laboratory that we, we've been buying this or buying tests from this company, AirCheck. Um, their laboratory is in Naples, North Carolina. Um, one thing to note though, is that these tests need to make it to the laboratory within eight days after the test is completed. And that's been a problem with first class mail in some, in some, uh, at some times and for some people. So either uh, we recommend you get the, the test in the mail the same day that you finish the test or, or another recommendation is to use something like a USPS priority mail flat, flat rate envelope. I think they're seven or eight bucks. Um, and this will guarantee that your, uh, that your test arrives at the lab on time. If it goes with outside that eight day period, they will report results up to 11 days, um, but beyond 11 days, um, you won't see any results. They'll, they'll give you an error. Okay, um, how to request a test kit online from our program. Um, as Joy mentioned, if, if you're not comfortable doing this online, we can always um, take your request over the phone um, and I, either me or, or Joy, I think Joy was saying she'd offer to do this as well. Um, and, and I can ask you questions or she can ask you questions that can, can get the, the test kit filled out or the, the questionnaire filled out. So if you're gonna find us online, go ahead and go to Google, um, uh, type in radon in Alaska. This is a, a, an easy way to find us. Um, if you type in radon in Alaska, the very first search result is going to be the DGGS radon page. I've got that link right here. Okay. So this is our radon in Alaska page. You'll find general information about radon. Um, right here is the section on our 2022 radon action test kit giveaway. Um, it does mention January, but we, we have plenty of tests left, so we're continuing to, to hand out tests. Further down this page, you'll also find a link to that Alaska radon map that we were visiting earlier. Um, so that link is right down here. Um, and there's other information, including the radon poster contest and um, general information about radon safety. But if I go back up to the top of the page, um, the radon test kit uh, giveaway. There's some rules here and then a section on how to participate. So it uh, says to request a testing kit, please fill out our online questionnaire. Um, you can click on that, follow that link to our online questionnaire and filling this out will get you into the system uh, to be uh, so that we know that you want a kit and we'll, we'll send one to you in the mail. Um, it <laughs> saved my, re my responses from earlier today. So I, I already filled this out. Um, it's just gonna ask you your name, um, your phone number, an email if you have it. And these are just, just so we can reach out and, and contact you. One, if there's a problem uh, with your test so that we can get you a replacement. And two, if you have high rate on levels so that we can contact you and discuss how, what, what's the best way to fix the problem. Um, the physical address of the, place where you'll conduct the test. Um, and then uh, below that, the uh, mailing address where you'd like the test kit mailed to, because these will be sent through the mail. Then getting into some questions. Uh, the first question is, has the property ever been treated for radon? Um, asking, is there a radon mitigation system in place? For most, most of you, this probably is no. Um, however, if you have things like uh, radon mitigation fans, um, probably don't have those, but if you had something like that in place or had um, some vapor barrier down your crawl space specifically for radon or other ventilation fans, um, you might wanna click yes. Uh, what is the primary reason you're interested in testing for radon? Um, it might be for your personal knowledge. You might be um, doing this in response to the outreach from this presentation. You can choose what you'd like. What type of foundation does your house have? 
or does your building have? And if you have multiple types, some, some homes have split level, things like that. You'll wanna choose the type of foundation that predominates in the building. Uh, basements any, are anything that's below ground um, and that's even partial. So daylight basements um, and walkout basements count as basement. Um, a crawl space uh, is kind of like a basement. There is an underground portion usually, but um, usually that underground portion does has a dirt floor or um, some kind of plastic down. Um, and the house is supported by a continuous footprint around the house of concrete blocks or timbers or something like that. Um, if you have a slab on grade, you have a concrete slab. Um, oftentimes basements have concrete slabs, but a slab on grade is gonna be totally above ground. Um, so the slab is sitting on the surface. Um, you might have a home with piers or pilings. Um, and there's two different types here. There's piers and pilings and then piers and pilings with skirting. Um, and if you have a home that's up on piers and there's no skirting underneath, then you don't need to worry about radon. Uh, there's no mechanism for radon to get into your home and concentrate. Uh, and so you don't need to conduct a test. Um, if you have skirting though around uh, the piers and piers or pilings, then you are gonna wanna test. Um, then you've created an, an enclosed space under the house where radon can, um, is encouraged to accumulate in your home. Um, most of you are probably going to be choosing uh, what type of building you'd like. Probably most of you are residential. Um, what type of residence is this? Um, could be a single level home, a multi-level home, any kind of multiplex, go ahead and, and click on duplex, mobile home, row houses, apartments, condos, and there's always other where you can type in what, what type of building you'd like. Um, on which floor are you going to conduct the test? Um, so this, again, you'll want to conduct the test in the lowest livable level of the home. Um, in the case of this scenario, I was going with the basement. And then what room are you going to conduct the test in? Um, again, this doesn't matter very much. You can put it anywhere that you'd like, anywhere that you spend uh, significant amounts of time. Bedrooms are great. Family rooms are great. Um, we just don't suggest that you have them in kitchens or bathrooms um, near or near sources of, of high heat or near doors that open to the outside. Then have you previously tested this home for radon before? Um, if you don't know, there's a, a space for that. Um, and then go ahead and you can pick up at our Fairbanks office, but I, I think most people have been choosing to have their kits mailed to them as far as how they'd like to receive their, their testing kits. Um, this is the question where you can decide if you would like to receive a long-term testing kit, um, those alpha track tests that last between three and 12 months. Uh, by default, we're gonna send you a short-term test. So if you leave this blank, um, you'll get a short-term test. Uh, but if you'd like a long-term test, we can definitely supply one. Um, then, yeah, here's just another note. We're reminding you that um, even though these kits come with prepaid postage, it's, it's really a good idea to use some kind of expedited shipping service to make sure that they get to the testing laboratory on time. And then the final uh, part of the questionnaire is asking you um, for the data release, uh, if we can use your data to inform that map that we, that we have published on our website. Um, so I'll, I'll read it just so everybody knows what it says. It says, I released my radon test result and environmental data to the Alaska Department of Natural Resources, um, DGGS, with the understanding that my results and data will be statistically merged with other radon data before it is made available to the public, and that my address and test result will be kept confidential, except in the event that a court of law orders that they be produced. Um, uh, sounds intimidating. But again, we, we've never, up to this point, we've never had a court order us to produce results, and I, I don't really see that happening. So we don't share your data with anybody else, um, no other departments. Uh, uh, we do report data to the CDC, but it is kept confidential. And then the last part, uh, I'm not going to click this here, but once you're done, you can go ahead and click submit, and that will send it to me.
Okay, so you've uh, requested your test kit, it's come in the mail, you've done the test, mailed it in, and, and now you have your results. Um, most of you are going to be using uh, short-term tests. So a short-term test uh, capture, kind of captures a snapshot of what radon concentration is, is in your house. Um, it's not that they're more or less accurate than the long-term tests, it's just um, the long-term tests are gonna capture um, closer, well, the closer you get to a year um, in the testing duration, the closer you'll get to the annual average rate on concentration, which is really what the EPA is talking about when, when they say four picocuries per liter as, as the action level. They're talking about the annual average concentration. Um, so the short-term test, uh, if you get a result, so I'll step through this chart here. If you get a result that's less than four picocuries per liter and you're testing in the winter time when radon levels tend to be highest, there's a pretty good chance that your annual uh, concentration is below the action level. And so you can say, um, I accept this level of risk, I'll go ahead and retest in five years. If your results are above four, um, the next question asks you, are your results uh, less than eight? If they are between four and eight, what you're gonna to wanna to do is conduct a long-term test. Um, this kind of intermediate zone where you're above the action level, but you're not super high, um, you're gonna to want to get that more, I'm not gonna say reliable, but uh, uh, the result that is closer to what the EPA is talking about. Um, I recently conducted this longer term test. So I, I, two years ago, I tested my home and came up with uh, 5.4 picocuries per liter in, in February. And then I conducted a year long test and just got the results back and, and they were two and a half. So, so I, I don't need to um, fix my home. Um, if your short term test results are, are higher than eight, um, there's a good chance that um, if you conduct a long-term test, that your levels are going to come back still above the action level. And so to expedite the process, uh, the idea is to conduct another follow-up short-term test just to confirm the first one. And you'll take the average of both those short-term tests. If the average of both those short-term tests are still above four, um, go ahead and uh, take steps to mitigate in your home. Um, there are kind of two main ways uh, of mitigating for radon um, to reduce the concentrations. The first is to dilute the radon in your home by mixing in fresh air. Uh, sometimes this is done in crawl spaces and basements that aren't lived in by adding some kind of ventilation, um, either passive or, or adding an active fan. Um, sometimes this is done by installing something like an HRV and adjusting it to make sure that the pressure in your home is correct and um, that enough fresh air is being brought in to bring your radon level down below the action level. Another easy thing to do is to plug holes and cracks in your foundation um, where they're accessible. Uh, we had talked about earlier how that, uh, there's a picture down here of a basement wall this joint between the block wall and the basement slab is, is pretty notorious for letting in a lot of air. So if that's accessible, um, you can go ahead and seal that or have somebody seal it with some caulking. Um, then kind of the last resort, the, this is kind of the nuclear option when it comes to radon mitigation, it's the sub slab depressurization. And that's what this picture here is showing. Um, it's a fancy term for having a pipe uh, penetrating below your foundation with a fan that's pulling air out from under your foundation and exhausting it to the outdoors. Um, it's just giving the air beneath your home uh, in the soil that's uh, laden with radon an easier path out than coming into your home. So the air under your house is going to preferentially go through this pipe and outside uh, safely where it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, where it's not going to concentrate in your home. And, and We've seen uh, homes with radon levels over a thousand come down to under the action level with one of these systems installed. 
Um, we have a few resources that we've produced. Um, there are other resources out there for mitigating homes. Um, uh, DGGS, we wrote this um, mitigating radon levels at home specifically for Alaska. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, there are some other resources out there like protecting your home from radon and then a Canadian guide. Um, the Canadian guide and the Alaskan version are, are more tailored to cold climates. Um, and some of the challenges that we face here in Alaska compared to the lower 48. There are a few contractors in town that do radon work. Um, nobody in the state of Alaska is currently certified or has maintained their certification with a national organization to do radon mitigation, but that doesn't mean they don't know how to do it. Um, it just means that they don't feel it's worth maintaining that national certification uh, that they can still get work without having it. Um, okay, so here is my contact information up here at the top. Uh, so again, my name is Sam Knapp. Um, my email address is uh, sam.knapp at alaska.gov. Um, here's my, my uh, work phone number, 907-799-6924. Um, so if, if you'd rather request a kit over the phone and I can help guide you through that uh, questionnaire, feel free to call me um, or send me an email. Uh, my colleague, Jen Athey is kind of the, the longstanding leader of this, of this project and will continue to administer this project at DGGS. Um, some of you who had received test kits in the past from Cooperative Extension Service, uh, you might recognize Art Nash as, as a name uh, who's been active in this project. And we, we continue to work with Art um, to uh, get test kits out to people and to help people mitigate their homes. Okay, um, so I think I'll, that's all I have. Um, I'll open the floor up for questions. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop screen sharing here and we can go back to the regular Zoom view. So does anybody have questions? I, that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Oh, thanks. No questions? No, I have some questions. Okay, Sherry. I wrote some down. So like um, in summer with your windows open, I borrowed a friend's um, radon detector that you can buy that you keep plugged in. Are those very good? Yeah, they are pretty good. Um, I think they're... It, it's nice to know um, one what the radon concentration is your home in your home is all the time, and to see what kind of different things that you do behavior wise can change the concentration. Um, is is that what you were looking at the difference yeah, between? But yeah, so like in the summer with the windows open, when it was windy, it seemed like the radon went way up, went up a bit. And so does weather have in it, radon in the air affect? So should you close your windows if it's going to be windy in summer? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, so. We weather definitely does have an effect on, on the radon concentration. Um, the air pressure can affect how much is coming out of the ground. And what you were seeing there uh, with, you know, the wind whipping by your house, it's the, the uh, I think it's the Bernoulli effect um, where uh, air moving past an opening is going to, or air, fast moving air is at lower pressure than still air. And so all of a sudden that fast moving air outside your house is all of a sudden drawing air from, from the inside and from the, the ground underneath your foundation. And uh, so if you don't mind me asking a couple mm -hmm. more. Um, so when you're doing that test, should it be in an area like, do you, is it okay to put it in a corner or do you want it out in the room more? I think it's okay to put it in a corner. Um, sometimes people are tempted to kind of hide it away in a closet and I wouldn't suggest that, but there's so much mixing of the air that happens within a room um, uh -huh. that it, it doesn't matter too much if it's in the corner versus like out in the middle. It is okay to have it on while you're doing the radon test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So your your HRV system is is helping your radon concentration, and so if 
you as a measure of like what what you're actively breathing if you wanted to see uh you know how your hrv was affecting uh your your radon concentrations you can certainly test with and test without but that might be a case, a case of finding your friend with the continuous monitor and yeah <laughs> and yeah. seeing how, yeah. how your hrv affects your radon levels right and so we can call you and just come in and pick it up right That's yeah right. yeah so we can either send it to you in the mail uh, um or the test kits are available at our office and you can just walk in and pick them up yeah you live close i mean i live close to you so. okay yeah thanks yeah what is your office address on college? It is uh, 3354. 3354. Yeah. Okay. And so you'll want, there are many entrances to the building, uh, but the main entrance is located in the parking lot that is shared with the PETA place. Okay. And secondly, about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. we, we did a test and we came back negative but does that mean anything would have changed in 15 years that's a great question um the recommendation as far as retesting is to retest every five years i think that if nothing has changed to your house like you haven't um for example done any modifications to the home you haven't changed heating systems five years might be a little bit soon on the other hand, um, you know, things like earthquakes can open up new paths through the soil for air to move. Um, melting permafrost can open up new paths for radon to come through the soil. So it, five, five years, I, it might be a reasonable time that you'd want to retest. Yeah, because we did it, as they say, about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll probably stop by your office then. Yeah. And, should, and we should call you ahead. Yeah, um, if, if you call, so if you want to stop by the office, um, we'd still have you fill out uh, that questionnaire either online or over the phone, um, just so that we can get the kind of the data about your house that goes alongside the test. Um, and then when you can come into the office, we'll just be able to give you a kit right away. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? So yes, I have another one, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. So supposedly someone right near next to me basically drilled and there was 40 feet of loss and they quit mm. drilling. So is the radon just coming up through all that? Right, so um, I would bet, <laughs> I would bet that when you test, you are going to have a relatively low radon concentration. Um, Typically, homes with high concentrations are closer to bedrock. That isn't always true, but that, that lust cap um, does a really good job of kind of halting or preventing gas movement through the, through the soil. And then I'm on a slab on grade, and mm -hmm. does cement itself release um, radon? No, cement doesn't. Um, not anything. Well, I shouldn't say conclusively that it doesn't, but um, unless the cement has uranium in the dust and, and it's, it's uh, very unlikely, um, then, then no. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, yeah, glad that we're able to offer this service. Um, it's 